So now that we've introduced you to the basic ideas of microevolution, the changes in gene frequency from generation to generation, we're going to move to macroevolution and speciation. Macroevolution applies microevolution, the very same processes that we've already talked about, to much longer time scales, like hundreds of thousands of years. And when you do this, that will explain how new species originate and evolve. Speciation specifically is the process of two populations becoming two distinct species. So speciation requires something called reproductive isolation. Remember that we defined a species using the biological species concept as the ability to reproduce and produce viable offspring. So if two populations are going to become two species, that means that they can no longer reproduce and no longer produce viable offspring. And that's going to come from reproductive isolation. No reproduction, no viable offspring. There's many different ways that you can get reproductive isolation. And I just want to go through a couple examples here. Um, Prezygotic reproductive isolation. Prezygotic is just a fancy word for saying the sperm and the egg never meet. So they don't have babies because those things don't even come together. Could be because they live in a different habitat or have a different activity pattern. Here we have two garter snakes. One lives in the water, one primarily on land. They could reproduce and produce viable offspring, but they never do because they live in different habitats. Here we have two different species of spotted skunk. One is diurnal and one is nocturnal. And so, again, they could probably reproduce and produce babies, but they're not active at the same time, and so they don't reproduce could be that they meet and don't mate. Uh, these are blue-footed boobies doing a fantastic uh, mating dance. Uh, and you have to do exactly the right mating dance. And if you don't do the right one, uh, they won't mate. And so they can get together, be in the same vicinity, but not reproduce. And that's all examples of prezygotic reproductive isolation. Postzygotic reproductive isolation means that the gametes, the sperm and egg, do meet, but the reproduction could be unsuccessful. Here we have red sea urchins and purple sea urchins. These guys use what's called broadcast fertilization, so they spew their eggs and sperm out into the water and they mix. They have different chromosome numbers, so when the egg and sperm try and come together, it doesn't form a successful zygote, and so reproduction doesn't happen. Could be that you do create a baby, um, but that baby doesn't survive very well and often doesn't go on to reproduce. That's called a hybrid between two species. And in this case, this salamander had one parent that produces a toxin and is bright orange and another parent that is brown and has good camouflage but doesn't produce toxin. So this poor guy is bright orange but doesn't produce toxin. So doesn't have camouflage, but also doesn't have the protection of poison. And so this uh, hybrid is not going to survive well. Finally, you can end up with sterile offspring. Remember that we define a species as a group of individuals that can reproduce and produce viable offspring. So here's an example of where reproduction happens. Babies are formed, but those babies cannot reproduce. So in the ca this case, this is a mule. Mules are produced by breeding a donkey and a horse together. They produce a baby that survives, but this individual cannot reproduce. So Mules are not a species, and horses and donkeys are two different species. Even though they can reproduce, their offspring cannot reproduce. Here's a plant example where the second generation of the plant is sterile and won't produce any seeds at all. And so these are not going to be the same species. There's a couple different mechanisms for speciation, but the main one is allopatric speciation. And this is just a fancy word for saying it happens when populations are physically separated from each other.
So one population becomes physically isolated from another. And here we have an example of beetles with a river that forms between the two populations. Geographic isolation prevents gene flow. So whatever divides the populations has to be big enough, significant enough, that it keeps these beetles from moving back and forth. And again, depending on the species, uh, something like a river could split apart insects, but it might not split apart two bird populations. So this depends a little bit on the species. Next, natural selection acts on each population separately. If there are environmental differences, then the populations will evolve differently. If the environments are the same on both sides of a, a barrier, then the two populations will remain similar. But imagine, let's say this side has more green trees and this side is a little bit drier and only grasses. There's going to be different selective pressures in those two different environments. And over many, many generations, based on microevolution, the populations will begin to change. Finally, the small changes will accumulate until both populations are reproductively isolated. Then we have two species. So now the changes that have happened by microevolution in this population have been different enough than these that we end up with reproductive isolation. They don't recognize each other or they try and breed and it's not successful and now we have two species where we started with one. Now one of the key things to recognize as the time scale for this is thousands and thousands of years. So this is not something that happens overnight. This is a very, very slow process as small changes accumulate over time. This next video about salamanders is a California example of how populations are slowly changing over time. We're back to this graphic because I want you to think about uh, speciation and where speciation might be happening here. So looking at these three populations, which do you think is an evolving population? Which could lead to speciation? and which would prevent speciation. So I'd encourage you to pause this and think about these questions and then restart when you want to hear the answer. So I'm going to start with C, which could prevent speciation. And the one that's preventing speciation is the stabilizing selection. Here the extremes are not being selected for and this mouse population is pretty much staying the same which could lead to speciation, that's going to be divergent selection. We're selecting for the white mice and the dark mice and there's these two extremes and you can imagine after a couple thousand generations maybe these guys don't recognize each other as the same kind. They become reproductively isolated and we end up with two species. Which is an evolving population? I would say all three of these are evolving populations. And remember, we define evolving as a change in gene frequency. So for each one of these, we're seeing changes in gene frequency from the original population here. So all three are evolving. couple interesting subtle points about evolution. There's something called sexual selection and this is differential female choice. This is when the evolution of a species occurs because of female preference. So here's a cute silly example. We've got a population of dinosaurs. Some are green and some are blue, but the blue females tend to pick the blue males and the green females pick the green males. And over time, they only reproduce with each other and eventually they don't recognize the opposite color as a member of their species and we can get uh, evolution happening even within a population. This is called sympatric speciation. This is speciation that's happening with populations that are not physically separated. Sexual selection is used to explain the peacock tail. 
uh, peacock tails don't make any sense. They slow the peacock down, they make them very visible to predators, and so the only reason you would end up with a peacock tail is because females really like them. This is called the sexy sun hypothesis. They pick the males to breed with that they want their sons to look like. There's also a debate in evolution about the patterns of macroevolution. So there's two main patterns that are indicated. So what this graphic is showing is the evolution of a particular group of butterflies. So here we have an ancestral butterfly back in time. And here we have current species. And somewhere along the line, the question is, did this butterfly go through these microevolutionary processes rather quickly and then stay the same for a long time to get to what we are? Or were there very gradual changes that developed between the two populations to end up with two species? So this model down here is the slow and steady model. This model is the punctuated equilibrium model. And the question is, which of these actually happens in nature? And I would say the answer is probably a little bit of both, depending on the species, which is one of those super annoying biology answers. But this is what happens. We have certain species that change slowly. Other species will have these rapid changes. These rapid changes seem to happen when there's sudden large environmental changes. Um, like a meteor hitting the planet and killing off all the dinosaurs. That's the kind of thing that could cause a radical environmental change that would allow rapid speciation for certain groups.